This is Nancy Rafal. I would like to call her my friend now. I think we've, we've uh, shared slideshows together and things like that, so that kind of seals the deal. Uh, she is a retired educator uh, working 29 years in DuPage County in Illinois. Um, she tells me that she feels she's spreading herself too thin up here. Um, I think no one told her it was retirement, you know, how, how that can get sometimes. I think that's it. She is a published poet. She has been the treasurer of the Friends of Tufts Point. And um, our community mural is her brainchild. She got it off the ground. She's been raising money for it um, and doing, oh, let's see, I think earlier this summer, she was hot on the trail of a scissor lift so that Ron can get up high. And you, and you succeeded. I saw him on there. Uh, she'll be doing a program in October for the Door County Historical Society, um, a program on the mural and telling you know how it got started and the process of making it and, and all that sort of thing. And we are sponsors of that mural and we're very proud to say that we are. So here is Nancy to tell us about Moonlight Bay. Give us a minute to uh, get the slides going and get the room dark, and hopefully I'll still be able to read my notes. So, uh, I do want to welcome you all and thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm calling this presentation, as you can see, Moonlight Bay Part 1 because I don't pretend to have all the information. I know there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, and I think that there's at least three or four more programs that we can do that center on Moonlight Bay. Um, and I'd like anybody who has more information, I've already spoken to people who uh, have more information about Spikehorn and the campgrounds and that little bit of a bay, and I will be going, um, I won't be talking much about Spikehorn today. Um, but right now, let's travel out of downtown Bailey's Harbor, and you know I had to put a plug in for the mural, <laughs> and turn right onto County Road Q, and continue for four miles until we see the waters of Moonlight Bay. If you're on your way, um, okay. Um, I've got a writer. No, I think this is going to be, yeah. Okay, thanks. So. Uh, if you're on your way to uh, Cana Island, continue up the hill and take the second right. This Google map uh, shows Cana Island. Um, there we go. Uh, there's Spikehorn Bay, here's Booze Point, of course Moonlight Bay, uh, County Road Q, down here is Stone Mill Lane, and uh, the Bailey's Harbor Swamp, Toff Point, and um, here would be the Ridges Sanctuary. And you can see those uh, ridge and swale formations here, but also, and you'll be a Another picture that'll show the uh, ridges and swales that are between um, uh, Stone Mill Road and County Q later. Okay, next. Um, I think to early residents, uh, Mud Bay and North Bay were kind of lumped together, and that whole area northeast of town 
was uh, referred to as simply North Bay. Only a few people in the early days lived beyond the Bailey's Harbor Swamp. Uh, a biography of Phoebe, Snow, uh, Phoebe Erickson states that uh, her childhood home was North Bay, Wisconsin. Erickson is a well-known children's book author and illustrator, and the, we're fortunate that our Bailey's Harbor Library has a wealth of information about her and a number of her books. Her most well-known work were illustrations for Anna Sewell's Black Beauty, but Erickson wrote and illustrated her, about her own pony, a book called Black Penny. Uh, that book was published in 1946 when uh, Phoebe Erickson was 39. I haven't really found when Mud Bay officially became Moonlight Bay. Platt maps through 1939, which this one is, re leave it unlabeled or refer to it as Mud Bay. Hank Whipple recently told me that his mother began the movement for the name change sometime in the 20s. Uh, but before we go on to the next slide, note all the lands that Cream City Brick held. And that was still in 1937. <clears throat> Another source uh, said that the change was instigated by Ch Chief Cir uh, Ch Circuit Court Judge Henry Grass who incidentally is uh, Hank Whipple's grandfather. Grass and his family lived in Green Bay, but had property at the entrance of what is now called Stone Mill Road. Uh, before the road, or Stone Mill Lane, before that road was put in, people reached uh, the area west of um, Rebolds Creek by motoring along the shore. Um, can you go back to that one or no? Yeah. Oh, good, good. And, ag and again, here you can see those ridges formations, just like in the Ridges Sanctuary. Uh, not quite as pronounced, but they are there. And this was the original, this is now the entrance to um, Stone Road or Lane. And I just heard from, um, I was talking with Dale Bino, and he said that at some point, I can't remember when he said this happened, but he met some people who were looking, wanted to go down to the end of the road to find the stone mill. They had no idea that this had nothing to do with milling or stone or anything, but had to do with the families that lived on the road. Um, okay, next. Uh, here is Judge Grass from a January 31st, 1936 Milwaukee Sentinel article. Apparently, he never owned an overcoat or a hat. And um, in addition to being a very active judge, he walked a mile from his home to uh, uh, the court building uh, every day, and that, that made the newspapers. When um, it, I found this interesting in going through a number of the, the articles in the um, Door County um, Library archives, when Judge Grass came up to the bay with, his, uh, with the men to go hunting, the newspapers usually referred to the bay as Mud Bay. When he came up with his wife, and if she brought her uh, friends from the women's club, the newspapers referred to it as Moonlight Bay. <laughs> uh, so I thought that was quite interesting. Um, Grass had cabins uh, built on the property and invited uh, Green Bay Scout Troops to camp there. The camp became known as Camp Grass 
and operated from the uh, 1920s into the late 1940s. There was even stationery that was printed and available for the scouts to write home. And Julie Knox provided me with this letter that her father, when he was a Boy Scout, uh, wrote home. And then um, Julie's dad bought property when part of the grass property came up for sale. And Julie and her husband uh, live there today. Much of the old growth forest around Moonlight Bay was tied to the, cre to, to the Cream City, the nickname for Milwaukee. The Cream City Burke Company, as I showed you uh, before, owned much of the acreage and clear-cut the boreal forest to fuel their brick-making operation. Um, some of the old pine trees that you see today were just saplings at, at the time that they did the clear cutting. Another thing that was interesting uh, that I found was that um, they advertised, this was in uh, a paper from 1897, and they were starting to buy up, the Cream City Burke Company was starting to buy up the property around Moonlight Bay and other places, and their big claim was that the lands were very fertile and would be good agriculture uh, lands once they got the trees out of the way. Well, I can tell you, I tried to plant daffodils on my, uh, and it don't, didn't work. <laughs> uh, Ron Bino, uh, auto mechanic who lived on Sunset Road near Mud Bay, and I love this story, but now I've, I've learned a little more about it told me that when he was a boy, he could see all the way to the water, which was a mile away. Well, in talking with Dale, his son, uh, Dale said that, well, yeah, that was when they widened and improved Sunset Road, which then gave a clear shot down to um, Rebels Creek and, and um, Moonlight Bay. So that, that was what he was looking at. Anyway, going back to Cream City Brick, the brick was found along the Menominee River Valley and along uh, Milwaukee's Lake Michigan shore. And the clay produced a cream-colored brick, hence the name Cream City. The bricks were very durable and stood up to harsh weather, uh, but they had one problem. They were very porous, so the dirt, the soot, and other pollutants really um, darken them in time. And I think it's a very difficult process because of that porousness to clean those bricks. Anyway, by the 1850s, um, the Cream City Brick Company, Cream City Bricks were much in demand throughout the Midwest, and the company prospered until the late 1870s when um, the, the veins of, of clay that produced the bricks was exhausted and probably they used up a lot of the lumber too. Um, Cream City bricks have found them way, there are buildings in Germany and France that are made from Cream City bricks. The water access to, to Toft Point is, of course, Moonlight Bay. And the lodge, when it was standing, faced the water. Thomas Toft never commercially logged the land, as is evidenced by some very old pines um, that are still standing. Toft had a small farm and did quarry stone and much of the stone ended up on building facades in Michigan. And this is a picture, of the, an early picture of the barn, which is still standing. Next. Another picture. This part of Moonlight Bay is very rocky and has little topsoil. 
There's some sand beach along Stone Mill Lane, and um, but toward the mouth of the bay on both sides, I can I can tell you it is very rocky. As you may know, Thomas Toff's daughter, Emma, maintained the lodge and cabins at the point. Emma Toft always referred to the bay as Mud Bay. And of course, Roy Lucas refers to it as Mud Bay. And I try to remember when I'm in his presence to call it Mud Bay. I don't always succeed with that. I have met a number of folks who have fond memories of camping and lodging at uh, the Toft property. Emma Toft uh, was a proponent of conservation, and she did much to protect wildlife. And I understand sometimes even with a shotgun. Um, this, that was my favorite picture of her. And of course, you can read the Toff family story in Roy Lucas's book. The Tuff Point property is now under the stewardship of the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. And a friends group has taken up the task of dosing and works closely with UWGB. And that friends group also does some maintenance uh, uh, letting the university know if a tree has fallen on the trail and uh, things of that nature. This memorial is also is at the site of the former lodge. You may be wondering about the song, and I can tell you that it was published in 1912. The song was used in several Looney Tune cartoons in the 1930s and the 1940s, and was featured in two Doris Day movies in the 1950s. I have no information about when our bay became Moonlight Bay. The earliest newspaper reference I found was from the Door County News, August 26, um, 1914, so two years after the song was published. So one can speculate that the song did influence the renaming of the bay. And if anybody has more information on that, I'd be happy to, to hear it. At the northeast, um, opposite Toff Point, is Boo's Point. Today, a, a solid public um, boat launch is located here. And this permanent dock replaces an earlier structure I remember from 20 years ago that was removed every winter by the town. And sometimes they just barely got it out of the water by the time it started to freeze. And I think before that, there was an earlier uh, here, there. There is a stone plaque, or a stone that is set with a commemorative plaque at the dock. Gives you some of the, the history of uh, Blue's Point. Um, and near the dock is, a, is Moonlight Bay Bedrock Beach. Uh, the information I had says it is a five acre undisturbed bed, bedrock beach, and I've I've walked in that area, and I can tell you, yeah, you're walking on stone. This property is owned by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and it was designated a state natural area in 1990. And there's a short walking trail to the beach, and uh, the DNR should repair their sign, I think. It's coming apart. Booze Point has an interesting history. In the 1860s, according to Janet Hogue McCray, two brothers by the name of Booze started a fishing colony on Mud Bay. This is the 1860s. Janet goes on to tell what was rumored to her family. 
and I'm quoting from her book here. They employed 100 lumberjacks to erect houses and barns, a schoolhouse, and a stockade of stone and timber to keep the cows and oxen in and the wild animals out. They farmed and fished and were quite successful. However, a series of strange incidents began to raise superstitious uh, fears in the hearts of the settlers. The first instance happened on a dark, and remember, I'm quoting from Janet's book, uh, ha happened on a dark night when one of the women went to the well for water. Looking down into the dark well, she saw a full moon reflected in the water, but there was no moon in the sky. Was this a sign? Then mysteriously, strange sounds issued from the, the barns and several uh, cows died and others gave no milk. What could this mean? Tragically then, uh, again, according to Janet, twin sons of one of the Booz brothers died suddenly of unknown causes. Could there be a demon involved? A last weird event finally convinced the people that their colony was bewitched. On a foggy night, they observed a strange green light moving about on the bay offshore, and go ghastly, ghostly sounds issuing from the mist. That did it. The next day, the whole colony packed up their belongings, said goodbye to the Cana Island lighthouse keeper, and headed west across the plains. A second incident uh, story, and this one was reported in the, in the Door County Advocate in 1877. And I'm paraphrasing this here. James Cady and A. Peterson were felling timbers along Mud Bay one March morning when they heard sleigh bells. The logging trail that the men were on ended a short way beyond where they were and that was the only road in the area. Soon a spirited team of horses, one coal black and the other pure white, came into view. The team pulled a logging sleigh, and in front was a man wearing a cap pulled down over his face so that it could not be seen. The man, the man on the, uh, with the horses stopped and shouted three times in a strange language, and then, without acknowledging the, the two men, took off down the road. Shortly, the team sped past the men going in the opposite direction. When Katie and Peterson were joined by their partners, no tracks could be found in the snow uh, for the mysterious horses and driver. Peterson, again, this is, was in The Advocate, uh, was convinced that the sighting was a warning of danger and he refused to work in Mud Bay again. There is one condominium uh, development along the west shore of Moonlight Bay, but the association's covenants permit only single family dwellings. And when we bought our property there, you can be sure that we read those covenants very well. But anyway, in, in 1969, John Brogan began advertising lots in Moonlight Bay. And this picture is from the 1969 plat map. Uh, Mr. Brogan earlier was instrumental in development along Glidden Drive. And he um, began, or he bought the acreage in Moonlight Bay um, in March of 1969. There were 61 lots that were platted out. Some have a uh, bay frontage, uh, but the majority do not. 
An article ran in the Milwaukee Journal on June 22, 1969. A selling point was that there was a long dock and a number of small boat um, moorings. Also from the, um, the slide with, with John Brogan's picture, uh, snowmobile trails. Well, there are not really that much snowmobile trails there. Most people go right down Cana Island Road if they're snowmobiling. Um, the, anyway, the, the uh, boat mooring pads now are unusable because of the low water level. Um, the dock, which originally was wooden, it was recent or was has been replaced. Uh, a community feature of the estates is a clubhouse which is available to residents for gatherings. The clubhouse and grounds uh, are the site of the annual lot owners meeting and their yearly potluck picnic. Right now there's a number of lots that are for sale um, in, in Moonlight Bay, some of them with houses and some of them unimproved. Moving right along to Rebels Creek, or Rebels. I'm not sure which is the preferred. I'm going to go with Rebels. Uh, Mud Lake is connected to Lake Michigan in Mud, Mud Bay by Rebels Creek. Property at the entrance of Moonlight Bay at the creek was owned by August Rebel. August and his wife Maria lived in Sturgeon Bay and had six daughters and a son. Mrs. Rebold died of a, of a uh, blood clot on her brain when she was 47 years old in 1905. The Moonlight Bay area has, is home to a wide variety of plants and animals. The mouth of the bay is a major, major whitefish spawning ground. Other fish um, include salmon, more out into the um, open waters of Lake Michigan. Um, and we had, a, I remember, a serious um, zebra mu mussel infestation about a decade or so ago. Emma Toss favorite thimbleberries are abundant. And they're just coming into um, fruit right now. The native columbine can be seen along with yellow lady slippers. We don't have too many trillium on this side of the, of the peninsula, but there are a few. Um, there are wood lilies, gay wings, and the endangered lake iris. Spotted coral root, um, various mushrooms and fun fungi. Um, I, at um, Toth Point, and I'm sure other places, nine bark bushes grow along the shore. Deer and turkey abound. Rabbits and coyotes are common. There are also gray fox, porcupine, raccoons, groundhogs, and did I mention turkey? A variety of birds, butterflies, and dragonflies can be seen, including the endangered Heinz emerald uh, dragonfly. Frogs and toads and snakes are also present. In the spring, the spring peepers along Highway Q can be gloriously deafening. Tough Point was a favorite a spot for Jens Jensen's clearing classes to come and picnic. He shared a Danish heritage with Emma Toth, and Nor Bly also brought his clearing classes to Tough Point into the um, 1980s. Today, you'll have to picnic in your car or at, at Rebels Creek or go to Cana Island or just enjoy time with friends. 
Well, this has been an overview of things I found about the history and the plants and animals of the Moonlight Bay, Bay Area. And as I said before, if you have any additional information, I'm sure we can put that, make that into another slideshow or two or three. Now that I know how to do this, thanks to Leanne, um, we, can, we can do it. And I thank um, the Bailey's Harbor Historical Society for um, twisting my arm to do this. Uh, the Bailey's Harbor Public Library, Jeannie provided me with the information about Phoebe Erickson, Roy and Charlotte Lucas, who are always so generous with their, their time and their pictures. Julie Knox provided the information about Judge Grass. Hello? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, okay. if you're going to have that, that mic here, you can tell you that. Okay. Right. Ready. And I can. Okay. She's going to do that. Get her to stand up there, too. Uh, does anybody have a question or a comment? Um, it isn't about that. It's about when, we, when you had the last picture with Cana Island being separate. And now when you go to Cana Island, you walk on something. You don't have to go through the water. When did that change? When the water went down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember in the uh, late 80s carrying camera equipment through that water wearing flip-flops. Not a good idea. I almost lost my camera equipment and my lunch. And um, what the, later when I saw that there was a causeway, I thought, oh, who built this? But no, that's just the water level has gone down. Yeah. Any other questions? Ju Julie, comment? did you have a comment? Oh, I just said, but the causeway, the causeway has been widened and improved quite a bit in the last few years. Right, yeah, there have been. And now there's a parking lot out there, too, so. Well, I hope if any of you have information about uh, or have uh, uh, camped at Spikehorn that you see me, because I think that's a whole topic in itself that should be explored. And then, you know, I'm bitten now because I think the Cream City Brick Company not only for the fact that they were in Door County, but I'm sure they must have been all over the state too. So I think that would be an interesting program. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Nancy, thank you so much. Um, that I, my favorite part was that Cream City Brick stuff. I had no idea. Very, very, very interesting. But it was a great talk, and it was fun working with you, and we all appreciate it. You can tell by the applause, I think. Yeah.